Pleasure to be here. First time in 40 years to be able to be on this side of the podium for a short course. This is great. Um, I'd like to uh, take what Robert just presented and uh, jump into the universe of managed lanes, both in Texas and across the country. Uh, spend a few minutes looking at the big picture, what's happening and where it's happening and why. A little bit about what's going on uh, in other parts of the country. Taking from that some lessons learned and sharing a little bit about what that's done in the design arena, how it's affected design. Um, and then close with borrowing a page from the, uh, the bi-monthly newsletter, the five things I hope you can take away from this presentation that will help you in your design work looking forward. First of all, the big picture. Uh, looking at what's happening around the country. How did we get to where we are? And to kick this off, I'm going to borrow uh, an economist viewpoint because it'll help us to clarify why we're doing what we're doing and that influences many design decisions. Um, this morning at 6.02 a.m. as I was going down the Katy Freeway, I think I found that magic point where supply and demand were in sync. And after 6.02, that commute grew to over an hour getting into Houston. And the point is, from the standpoint of all of our, our publics out there, we're trying to balance supply and demand in a roadway system in Texas that meets all the different needs that exist. It's a difficult art, and it's particularly hard when we're growing at the pace that Dennis Christensen mentioned this morning, uh, growing at such a pace that we are outpacing most other states. Um, so we have, as a result, limited capacity and rather unlimited demand. And that puts us in this position of having a scarce resource where we can't provide everything that our customers want. And we have various ways that we can try to tackle that problem. We can increase capacity, that's historically been our approach. We can reduce demand, and we can look at managing access. Reducing demand and managing access uh, are obviously problematic from a variety of standpoints, but they are our way and our key to the future. If we look specifically at these three different approaches, each has their own unique implications. Our building more lanes simply means that we have to look at what we have in the way of a resource that's out there, right away, funding, environmental issues to try to tackle that in our most urban areas. We don't always have the ability to do that from a system standpoint. Just because we can add 22 lanes to the Katy Freeway doesn't mean that we can add them to the West Loop or to the other linkages to that system. So increasingly, we're looking not only at a problem in a quarter, but at a system level. And then if we look to the other potential strategies, like reducing demand, that's also meaning that we have to rely upon other modes to pick up the slack or changing driver behavior in some form. In essence, the managed lanes that are being applied in Texas and have been since 1979 accomplish or try to address all three of those strategies in some uh, combination or mix. They do so by expanding capacity. We're taking whatever we can add out there and managing it to a higher and better use in perpetuity. We're trying to shift demand often into transit or van pools or car pools. And increasingly, because we have a new tool called electronic toll collection, we're utilizing pricing, as, as Robert was mentioning, to better manage the demand that's out there during certain times of the day. Well, why are managed lanes more efficient? And this is where perception and reality are often out of sync when we go out to our public. This happens to be State Route 91 in California, but it could just as easily be Katy in Houston. And it's interesting that uh, during our maximum periods of demand, our managed lanes are moving more vehicles than our vehicles that are stuck in congestion. We're getting more flow rates there. We're getting higher throughput. It doesn't look like that when you see this photo, but that's what we're accomplishing. And that's what our goal is in a managed lane context, is to be able to maintain a flow rate that keeps us from breaking the back of the capacity curve that we often see happening when we go into gridlock. Um, we can also look at this from another perspective, and that's changing, as, we, as I said, reducing uh, demand by changing driver behavior. 
This happens to be from one of the very first projects that uh, TextDot demonstrated in 1979-1980. In and it shows a three-fold increase in the number of van pools on the I-45 North Freeway in Houston. And here again, we were having a significant impact on throughput, this case, person throughput, that we could not achieve without that dedicated lane. So it changed driver behavior, whether it's into transit or other modes. Um, the ability to provide a travel time savings and a reliable trip have a significant impact on being able to move uh, people and vehicles more effectively. So what's in a name? Even within the state, we have a lot of different definitions for managed lanes and how they're applied. In its most universal context, managed lanes are dedicated lanes, proactively managed, so that they essentially don't break down. And that requires a lot of tricks in our toolbox and it requires those in real time. And if we do that well, we get a lot of different benefits that you see here that are accomplished when we do it well. We have a broad universe of different ways we can try to mix and match those strategies. And just like in Texas where you see some projects that are HOV lanes and others that are express lanes that are applied largely to all people with, with electronic tolling, you can see that different mix and match occurring where we have everything from hot lanes to HOV lanes, we have a couple of bus lanes, and we have a lot of, of, of tolled express lanes that are now occurring in our major metropolitan areas like Dallas-Fort Worth. Increasingly, we're gonna see active traffic management play a role as well. We heard this morning about what's coming at us in the way of new technologies, autonomous road vehicle opportunities, it's very likely that we're going to see some of these applied on our managed lane investments that are out there today. We have a lot of names that we give these lanes when we're out marketing to the public. TextPress is one example in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. There are terms like the Katy Tollway, used in Houston. And around the country, we have a variety of other names that these are called by. But in a, in a context of, of what's happening around the country, it's not so much what it's called, it's essentially how we're utilizing those tools to accomplish the goals that are set forth. And therefore, consistency is not a requirement between our different metropolitan areas in Texas. We would not, as a result of that, expect our design consistency to be the same either on such principles of whether this is a reversible lane or a two-way facility or whether it's one directional lane or two or more. Each is going to have its unique role to play in a system-wide ne network or context. So who's done what and where? Well, first of all, we have two broad categories of projects that are happening right now. We have 25 that are uh, price managed lanes around the country. That's gonna double in the next three years, three to five years. And a lot of that growth is happening right here in Texas. We have conversions that are taking place. Uh, you may already know that the HOV lanes in Houston have now been converted with tolling technology to allow for a greater number of use by uh, SOVs and others during the periods of, of lesser demand. In the peak of the peak, those lanes still become HOV only. So those are conversions and they can happen on a, a single lane type treatment as you see the examples here for overutilized or underutilized situations. Historically around the country, most of our HOV lanes right now are overutilized, so we're having to look at pricing as a means of managing that flow better. Increasingly in Texas, we're looking at adding new lanes and adding new facilities, like the ones that have just opened. Uh, NTE and LBJ are good examples of that. And that list is growing much faster and it will looking forward. So if we look back just a very short period of time, we had our first projects in Texas in 1979-1980. We uh, continued to grow HOV lanes around the state for the next 20 years or so. We started having price managed lanes uh, in 1995, and this is the way the map looked like by 2003, not very many examples. But you can see here that by 2013, that number is growing, and it will continue to grow looking forward to the point that we have 30 projects by 2015. So bottom line here is, as a designer, adding uh, or considering uh, pricing tolling on the facility, electronic tolling, is really the wave of the future for most of these projects. We're going to see most all of them have that degree of instrumentation uh, on just about anything that's added. 
The design of managed lanes really runs the gamut from where we started to where we are now. It was much easier to add electronic tolling to barrier separated facilities. And so those were our first projects that we had in various parts of the country. But increasingly today, most of the projects are not barriered because it's very hard to retrofit a barriered environment in the limited rights of way that we have available. So increasingly, buffer separated facilities of one type or another are increasingly applied. All of these facilities can work rather well. Uh, they have their own context into how they work, but taking a page out of what Gilmer said earlier, it's a whole lot better to consider having a managed lane than not having it. And so therefore, if you can make anything fit, even if it's in a corridor as tight as Mopac North, which is under construction right now, uh, it gives greater flexibility for providing mobility in that corridor. An access treatment is also a category of design where we've seen a lot of variance around the country. And in access, we're looking at two major schools of thought right now for at-grade access. One is whether it is controlled through ded dedicated ingress-egress zones, like you see on the, uh, the right-hand side right here, excuse me, with this kind of treatment, or whether it's uh, continuous access. And increasingly, we're seeing another, a number of places, um, Seattle, one location, the Bay Area, another, where open access is being considered because it handles transit volumes better and it handles origins and destinations better. But it requires a greater level of instrumentation in the roadway system to be able to effectively manage and toll that facility. Access treatments are also very unique to the design context that we have. In Texas, we have and will have in the next few years probably more of the design that you see here on the right, the flyover design that works so nicely with frontage roads um, coming off the projects that are opening. This is a design that offers a high-speed facility. We can still get access control from our frontage roads as well as the main lanes and it provides for a very safe type of mo movement and maneuver. And we've had some of these on some of our HOV lanes dating from 1985. We are also seeing the need for greater design flexibility. And I'll use two examples here to offer you on what flexibility truly means. Um, might be called the second generation of managed lane facilities. We've had projects, some of them operating legacy projects for 20, 30 years. Uh, this happens to be from San Diego where they took a two-lane reversible facility and made it a four-lane facility. But the middle of the four-lane facility has a movable barrier. This barrier can be moved so that that can become a 2-2 or 3-1 facility by the time of day. And so they have a lot more flexibility in how they can meet different demand conditions and even special events with that kind of cross-section. We have our own example to point to on Katy where the design of this facility that was environmentally cleared gave us a wide enough cross-section to be able to treat one side of the roadway or the other as a continuous runway of pavement that gives us the flexibility to move the access locations that Robert was pointing out to, even a possibility of adding auxiliary lanes between some of the on and off ramps. In other words, we can address those changing conditions a lot easier in this facility as those conditions represent bottlenecks to some of the demand that's occurring out there. <coughs> so, if we were to uh, step back from everything that's happening and look at the, uh, the lessons that have been learned around the state and around the nation, uh, the, first, the first item I hope you could take away with you is that Texas leads the nation in price managed lane facilities as of today. Uh, we started a long time ago. We've come a long way. We have more invested in managed lanes than any other state at this point. And we will have even more when the projects open that are currently in development. And that's quite something to say because it, it speaks volumes about the reason why. We have one of the fastest growth rates in the country and growth is a key attribute to demand. So it's not surprising that we're turning increasingly to a tool, a subset of lanes out there to be able to give us mobility and perpetuity in what are otherwise going to be very congested corridors. Second, this would not have happened without a great deal of partnering. We have some of the earliest examples of partnering in the state 
Houston Metro partnered with TxDOT to pay and build for some of the HOV lanes that happened in Houston as far back as 1978. And that partnering continues today with the RMAs and with transit. And that partnering is very critically based upon a lot of champions. Champions within the department. I can speak to Bill Ward that had his drawings in his desk drawer years ago as the district engineer in Houston um, that he wanted to develop the first busway in the state. Pretty odd to say when you're in the highway department, but he did. And we've had so many champions follow since then, right up through today and all the projects that are happening. Similarly, we have those champions inside our RMAs, CTRMA and NTTA, HECTRA, as well as the transit authorities in the state. So it's important to realize that that's not just lip service. These are agencies that bring money to the table. They are partnering in providing resources that are needed day to day on the, the design and the implementation and operation of these facilities. Transit plays a very key role in all this. Um, certainly in Houston, the role of transit, and I'm just going to pick on Houston, but it could just as easily be any of our major cities, is such that uh, transit moves significantly more people in these corridors than we could otherwise move in any other way. Tens of thousands of commuters a day. It is our rubber-tired commuter rail system in a lot of corridors where infrastructure has been put in to best collect and distribute transit patronage along these facilities. And that's very important in being able to get more productivity out of these corridors and out of these lanes. Four, and this is uh, an attribute that I want to uh, make sure that we take advantage of. We have the longest legacy in Texas for performance monitoring of these investments, going back 37 years. If what Robert just presented to you is a near-term example off of one project, that same level of data exists for most of our projects since they were implemented. And that's where we learn a lot about what works and what doesn't work, what are the safety implications of particular decisions that are made. And that's helping us look forward in projecting what specific needs should be uh, embodied in guidance. And indeed, right now, there is an NCHRP effort afoot to develop managed lane guidance for the rest of the country. This comes off of the kinds of performance monitoring research that exists to be able to pull that information from. And finally, uh, and this is a guarantee, this morning around the state there were enforcement agents out at 5 o'clock opening and closing gates on some of these facilities. There was TxDOT maintenance staff certainly making sure that debris was out of the way of many of the facilities that were about to open. There was a call center that came online like NTT or Hectra to be able to operate and address questions from customers and their transponder accounts. And the point being that these investments take a great deal of, of resource from a number of different agencies, including TxDOT. And that is the wave of the future. Uh, it's a guarantee that there will be an ongoing commitment to the operation and maintenance of these facilities and to the need, as Robert pointed out a moment ago on the KDK study, to change the design as changing conditions occur in the field and as new technologies take us in directions to get even more effective performance out of these lanes. All of these different attributes are going to continue to influence design. And so uh, those are the important attributes I hope you can take with you because we are going to continue to see more and more of these investments moving forward in the state and certainly uh, the rest of the country is watching. Thank you.